So a couple weeks ago, this arrived in the mail. Um, this is, of course, my book, Century of Song, which is a history of American popular music as told through a hundred songs. This has been over a year in the making, so being able to, you know, physically hold this book in my hand makes it feel very real. So I just wanted to kind of share this book with you guys. We're going to look through a bit of the inside because I think my design team at Page Street did an awesome job. And then I'm going to read you a little chapter from the book uh, about Benny Goodman. So yeah, this is super casual. Call it story time with Polyphonic, I guess. One of the big things for me when I was talking about developing this project was I always believed the visuals to be a big part of Polyphonic and I wanted that to be, you know, relevant in the book. I created these beautiful sort of chapter heading images, so it's full of those. Um, and then just, yeah, if we just look at the pages, there's the layout. I just think they did a good job and I'm super proud of this, so I wanted to share it. Oh, oh, here's, a, here's another good one. I was... I was pretty, I was pretty happy about this one. Um, let's do a close up. A hey. yeah. So there's uh, eleven artworks like that throughout the book, and then there are a hundred one entries on individual songs, as well as a number of honorable mentions. So we're gonna get into one of those songs. So you know, snuggle up, get a cozy cup of coffee or something. Uh, it's story time. It might seem like a paradox that one of the darkest chapters in American history spawned one of the most joyful, exuberant movements in all of music. But really, it was inevitable. The human spirit is a resilient thing. When pushed to the brink, it will often respond with defiance and celebration. That's what swing music was, an exuberant celebration of all the joys of human life, forged in an era when so many people had so few joys to look forward to. Swing was an extension of the jazz music that flourished in the 1920s, thanks to such artists as Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. In a time of scarcity, swing was a music of excess. The bands were big, the arrangements were loud, and the accompanying dances consisted of elaborate feats of coordination and aesthetics. The most famous of these dances was the Lindy Hop, an acrobatic style of dance that came up in the ballrooms of Harlem alongside swing itself. Both started in predominantly black communities in the late 1920s, but by the mid-30s, both had crossed over into mainstream America. Throughout the jazz age, jazz had approached the boundaries of popular music time and time again, but had never fully crossed over. As is all too often the case, it took a musician who wasn't from the black communities that originated swing to cross it over into white America. The man who accomplished that feat was named Benny Goodman, and in his day, he was known as the King of Swing. Goodman was the ninth child born to a pair of Russian Jewish immigrants in Chicago. He grew up in abject poverty in a tenement, and found escape from this bleak situation by throwing himself into the jazz scene that was exploding in Chicago at the time. Goodman quickly developed a knack for the clarinet. He found work as a sideman while still a teenager, and by the time he was 20, he was leading his own band. In 1935, at the age of 26, Goodman's orchestra scored their first major hit with a Fletcher Henderson arrangement of the jazz standard King Porter Stomp. That record kicked the burgeoning swing era into high gear and lifted Goodman to levels of fame and fortune that few musicians before him had ever seen. Radio performances and shows at all ages venues had endeared Goodman to a younger generation of teenage fans looking for hope and escape in a world that seemingly had no future. They showed up in droves, plastering posters on their walls and chasing after autographs from Goodman and his swing contemporaries. It was the first time in American history that popular music had truly been a youth movement, led by teenagers. In fact, Benny Goodman and the entire swing movement was the birth of so many aspects of pop music that we now take for granted. Because of the tight economic situation, the swing bands were some of the first to embark on the sort of grueling cross-country tours that are the norm in music today. Swing was also one of the first popular music movements to spawn moral panics and culture wars between the younger generations and their parents, a pattern that plays out again and again for each subsequent generation. These panics couldn't slow the meteoric rise of the Benny Goodman Orchestra. As the swing era picked up, his band recorded hit after hit, 
almost single-handedly jolting the dormant record industry back to life. In 1937, Goodman and his orchestra released the original recording of Sing 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 with a Swing. The arrangement of the song, done by Jimmy Mundy, took it miles away from Louis Prima's original 1936 version. It wails and roars with wild energy and non-stop rhythm, stretching the song across both sides of a 78 RPM record. It showed off Goodman's wild clarinet chops, atop Gene Krupa's legendary rumbling drums, horn lines come in and out, serving as exclamatory punctuations of pleasure and joy. The song features one of the most famous drum breaks in jazz history, and some of the catchiest melodies of the era. It quickly became the band's biggest hit, and added another feather to Goodman's cap. By the end of 1937, the momentum of swing music was unstoppable. The Benny Goodman Orchestra had become famous for their swingin' performances in ballrooms and dance halls across the country. But publicist Wynne Nathanson had bigger ambitions. He booked the Benny Goodman Orchestra to play the famed Carnegie Hall on January 16, 1938. It was the first time a jazz artist would play such an auspicious venue. It was an echo of Paul Whiteman's famous experiment in modern music, which, by the way, I detail in the entry for 1924. Rhapsody in Blue. Benny Goodman's Carnegie Hall show was attended by many of the most celebrated names in music at the time. It was a collision of the old classical establishment and a new jazz youth movement. It was the first time that jazz was truly taken seriously as an art form by those outside the movement. Goodman's orchestra were tentative to start this historic show, but by the end of the first song, they'd shaken off the nerves and remembered how to swing. They played a raucous set that included a brief history of jazz and featured guest appearances from members of Duke Ellington and Count Basie's bands. By the end of the night, Goodman's orchestra had fans old and young alike standing up and dancing in the aisle of Carnegie Hall. They closed the night on a 13-minute rendition of Sing 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 complete with a spontaneous Jess Stacy piano solo that added a touch of elegance to a piece full of bombast and vigor. The recordings of this Carnegie Hall show wouldn't be released until 1950, but listening to them now, we can understand what it might have been like seeing Benny Goodman in his prime. That Carnegie Hall concert was a landmark moment in jazz and marked a high point in Goodman's career. That concert, like much of his career, is a sheer triumph, it's a celebration of instrumental talent and emotional release, created by a Jewish man who raised himself up from nothing in a burgeoning age of anti-Semitism. And yet, Benny Goodman's career comes with complex baggage behind it as well. Like Paul Whiteman before him, he never pretended to own jazz or swing music. Goodman paid deep respect to the black musicians who pioneered the genre and tried to platform them when he could. But the fact that he was able to find levels of commercial success far beyond that of black contemporaries like Basie or Ellington is an indication of the pervasive racism of the times he lived in. Stating this reality is not a diminishment of his legacy. In fact, Goodman probably helped tear down those very racial barriers by bringing swing into the mainstream. But it also marks the beginning of yet another pattern that would repeat across music history art forms created by black communities becoming legitimized in the mainstream only when performed by artists who aren't part of those communities themselves. So there you have it. That's my chapter on Benny Goodman. As you can see, you know, I sort of try to create a narrative and tie some themes throughout the story as it emerges. So you can read the story front to back and you'll get a decent, I think, chronological history of a lot of aspects of American music, but you can also jump around and read whatever chapter you like and whatever song interests you. And to that, I will probably record a few more of these story time with polyphonic videos in the not too distant future, so you can get some sneak peeks at a few more of these. If you like that and you want to support the book, it's coming out everywhere books are sold on September 17th. Or alternatively, if you really want to help support me, you can pre-order the book now. Pre-orders can really help promote book sales, get books on bestsellers lists, really just do industry stuff that'll help the book perform better and help me as an author. So if you want to help support me, going to that link in the description and pre-ordering the book is a great way to do so. And if you've already pre-ordered it, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really proud of this and I appreciate that you 
put your faith in me and that you're looking forward to my work. Here, here, actually, just thought of this. I'm going to show you guys some of the, uh, a sneak preview of the table of contents. Boom. You can, you can look at that as you will. And here, let's say whatever song is highest in the comments, I'll do my next story time with Polyphonicon, I guess, so you guys can, can get access to that chapter. So go engage. Toot, toot, yay, algorithm. <laughs> uh, see, I'm a content creator now. Thank you guys for your support. Pre-order the book if you want to read about American music history. And uh, I'll see you soon.